Hello, Wonder Hussy here, camping out with my good friend Dutch Eric, who's been traveling around the US in this amazing converted school bus. And as you might guess from his name, he's from the Netherlands, but he's been staying at our Death Valley compound quite a bit lately uh, until it got too hot. So we both happened to be traveling around and we decided to meet up here at the fabulous Black Rock Desert in Northern Nevada. Okay, the Black Rock Desert has this vast playa, which is something like 200 square miles, and it's one of the largest, flattest surfaces on the entire Earth. And it's obviously super windy out here today. Sorry about the wind noise, but that's part of what makes this playa so popular with land sailors, okay? If you've ever seen land sailors, those guys that, it looks like they're windsurfing, but they do it on dry land. There's a bunch of them camped out right next to us. Well, I say right next to us, but this playa is so vast. They're probably like a mile away. Anyway, aside from land sailors, this playa is also really popular with uh, racers, okay? There's been a lot of land speed record attempts out here on this playa, just like they do over at the Bonneville Salt Flat. Well, a lot of people take experimental cars out here because it's 200 square miles and it's flat. And well, actually one guy did set a record, I think in 1997, some guy in a supersonic car got up to, I think like 763 miles per hour. But these days, this playa is probably best known as being the home of the Burning Man Festival. Okay, if you've ever heard of Burning Man, it's this giant kind of arts and music festival out here on this giant dry lake bed. 80,000 freaks and hippies show up and, well, dance and party and partake of all kinds of interesting substances. And that's actually how I know Dutch Eric. We met here at Burning Man three years ago. <laughs> And well, we've been friends ever since. And he's planning to take that pretty little bus up to Burning Man this year, actually. And I'm sure it's gonna get trashed. Uh, that's right. They took a couple years off for Burning Man because of the pandemic, but uh, 2022, they're gonna have it right here. Well, not right here, well, somewhere over there. And it's hard to believe that, gosh, it's so, well, aside from the wind, it's so peaceful and desolate out here right now. It's hard to believe that in, two and a half months, there's gonna be 80,000 people camped out here with lights and music and aggressive bass and flame effects and all kinds of craziness. Anyway, aside from speed demons and hippies and land sailors, this playa is also popular among hot springs aficionados because there happen to be a bunch of hot springs in this area, most of them sort of along the perimeter of the playa, which is where we're camped, right near, oh gosh, I guess we're kind of near the southeastern edge. There's railroad tracks running right along the edge here, but there's hot springs all around this vast and amazing desert. And I should know because I've spent the last two weeks traveling around in my rig before I met up with Eric, checking out as many of them as I could. And I've made videos at some of these hot springs before, like Black Rock Hot Spring, which unfortunately somebody died at last year, I think. So they took that little dock out and double hot hot spring where you can still see the remains of an old pioneer wagon from the days when the Oregon Trail passed through this playa. That's right, the pioneers on their way from Missouri to Oregon passed right through this crazy landscape. Can you imagine? So anyway, I've been to Double Hot and I've been to Black Rock and I've been to a bunch of other hot springs up in this general area, but the one hot spring I always wanted to visit more than any other was the Fly Geyser. Okay, the Fly Geyser is kind of famous. You might've seen pictures of it before on Atlas Obscura or Only in Your State or one of those websites. Well, it's basically a huge mound of psychedelic multicolor mineral buildup with hot water gushing out of the top 24 seven. I guess it was accidentally created by man back in 1964 by this company that was uh, drilling for geothermal energy, but apparently the water they hit there wasn't hot enough for their purposes. So they just kind of abandoned the well 
And over the years, the hot water just kept pouring out of it. And it was so mineral rich that it eventually, I guess over time, built up and formed this crazy sort of terraced volcano looking thing. I mean, it's absolutely amazing to behold. And the best part about it is it's surrounded by hot springs. But unfortunately, I was never able to visit Fly Geyser because it's located on private property and there's all kind of no trespassing signs and security cameras. I guess what happened is uh, the original broke ass hippie artists who started Burning Man in the first place way back in the day uh, have since become rich bourgeois hippies thanks to the fact that their quirky little desert party blew up in popularity to the point where 80,000 people attend it nowadays. I mean, think about it. Burning Man literally started as just an informal small party of friends on a beach in San Francisco, maybe 100 people, burning this little wooden man they made. But apparently it was such a fun party that, well, the next year, more people came. And then the next year, more people came. And finally, so many people came that they thought, well, let's just move the whole damn party out here to the middle of nowhere where nobody can mess with us. But even out here, more and more people started coming every year until it was a thousand and then it was 10,000. Now it's 80,000 people that come out here and it's an internationally famous festival and it costs something like $500 to attend. Well, all those $500 tickets added up to the point where eventually the nonprofit that runs Burning Man was able to buy the property where the Fly Geyser is. So now it's owned by the Burning Man organization, but the good news for us hot springs nuts is they do give paid tours. Okay, you can take a paid tour. You're probably wondering how I got all this amazing footage of the Fly Geyser. Well, that's because I took the tour last week and it was amazing. I definitely recommend taking that tour uh, if you're interested at all in the Black Rock Desert in general because they do give you a lot of information about the landscape and the environment, but that was all interesting. But I was really just there to see the geyser. I mean, for a hot spring nut like me who's been to over a hundred hot springs, going to Fly Geyser is sort of like making a pilgrimage to Mecca. You know how Muslims, once in their life, they're supposed to make that pilgrimage to Mecca and go touch the holy Kaaba, I think it's called? Well, as a hot spring nut, going to the Fly Geyser was kind of the same thing, only, of course, I wasn't able to touch the Fly Geyser. And if I had touched it, well, the water coming out of it is so hot, I probably would have burned my hand. So just seeing it in person was amazing. Unfortunately, though, the only bummer of the tour is they don't let you actually get in and soak in any of the hot springs. I mean, obviously, yes, the Fly Geyser itself is way too hot to soak in, but I think there's something like six or seven other hot springs on their property in that area right around the geyser. But unfortunately, those are reserved for the owners and the volunteers who work there. So yeah, if I ever decide to go up and volunteer and work on that ranch, well, then I might be able to go soak there. But for right now, I'm S-O-L. Well, okay, fine then. I don't need your bougie, fancy, hippie hot springs anyways. There's plenty of other hot springs out here I can go to. And so that's just what we did. Uh, I met up with Eric last night uh, in the town of Gerlock, or yesterday afternoon, and we drove out here to this little hot spring on the east side of the playa, just across the railroad tracks. This is Trago Hot Springs. I feel okay saying the name of this one because it's on all the maps and pretty much, well, most people who've been to Burning Man already know about this hot spring, so it's not exactly a secret. Uh, in fact, back in the early days of Burning Man, people who went to Burning Man used to come out here. They would just drive across the playa and go take baths, mud baths in the hot spring midweek. Obviously, once uh, thousands and thousands of people started coming to Burning Man, well, they ended up having to close these hot springs off because, well, you really don't want like 3,000 filthy hippies wallowing in this thing over the course of one week. So nowadays, when you go to Burning Man, uh, I think for like two weeks around the event, they close all the hot springs off around the playa. And in fact, they even post guards. Anyway, I just thought this would have been a nice place to camp last night, especially because the moon was full and it would have been an epic soak. But when we got here, there was, a, there was two guys here in a truck 
from the Desert Research Institute, and they were doing some kind of water tests. <laughs> and after talking to them, I realized it would not be a good place to soak at all. And it's funny because as I was talking to the guys, I did remember reading a story in the news not that long ago uh, that they found E. coli in this hot spring. Okay, E. coli, it's a deadly bacteria that, well, basically comes from poop. <laughs> and they found it in this hot spring, which I guess isn't really a shocker when you think about all these, well, all these dirty hippies that come soak in places like this. I mean, I'll be honest, many of the time I've sat and soaked in a beautiful natural hot spring out in the middle of nowhere with a friendly group of people and we're all hanging out, drinking and passing around joints and it's just so nice. But then every now and then it'll occur to me, gosh, I wonder how thoroughly these people clean themselves. You know what I mean? There's bound to be at least a few dingleberries on every traveling van lifer. And not to disparage van lifers, uh, they actually just had the same problem in Vegas, at some of the Vegas hotel swimming pools where they have those big daytime pool parties. Well, it was just in the news that they tested the water at one of those pools and found E. coli there too. So I'm not just bagging on hippies. I'm not just bagging on van lifers. I guess I'm just bagging on people in general. And if you think about it, those Vegas hotel pools are treated with chlorine and they still got E. coli. I mean, obviously, this little hot spring here is not treated with chlorine or anything like that. So gosh, it's probably an even riper environment for bacteria. Uh, and matter of fact, the guys that I was talking to from the Desert Research Institute said not only did they find E. coli in this hot spring, they also found cholera. Okay, cholera. Yikes. I mean, that is actually weirdly kind of fitting considering, uh, like I said earlier, these hot springs are along the old Oregon Trail. You know, the pioneers walking across the country to get to Oregon and get that sweet, sweet free farmland. Well, if you're familiar with anything about the, the history of the Oregon Trail, something like one out of every 17 people on that journey died. And a lot of those deaths were due to cholera because they would camp right by a water source. And I guess they would just poop and pee basically in the same water source that they were getting their drinking water from. So in a really messed up way, there being cholera in this hot spring on the old Oregon Trail is just sort of historically fitting. But it is a pretty big bummer because, I mean, if you look at it, this is a beautiful hot spring. The water is really clear. It's got a nice uh, kind of silty, muddy bottom. Probably got really nice clay, it's doing really nice mud bath like the old hippies from the old burning early days of burning man used to do and i'll be honest when i first got here yesterday i was like oh well e coli shmi coli i'm not gonna put my nose underwater anyways i mean i make it a practice never to put my nose underwater in any hot springs because all hot springs are potentially home to that uh, brain eating amoeba i think it's nagler naglary Nagleria falleri, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but it's a bacteria that can only enter through your nose and it's only found in waters above a certain temperature. And it's not just hot springs. I mean, there's lakes, like Lake Havasu, for instance, is warm enough to where this um, flesh-eating, brain-eating amoeba can survive. And in fact, somebody did die from swimming in Lake Havasu because of that amoeba. So it's not just a problem with hot springs, but I don't want to get a brain-eating amoeba. So anytime I go to a hot spring, I always keep my nose above water. So I figured, okay, if I'm not putting my face underwater, what difference does it make if there's E. coli, cholera, whatever? I mean, E. coli and cholera can't get in through your pores of your skin. <gasps> but then I thought, uh oh, what about my, well, what about my lady bits? And so Eric, <laughs> good old Dutch Eric, Googled it last night. And apparently, yeah, you can get a urinary tract infection from E. coli in your, well, we'll just say hoo-ha. So I decided, Better not get in these hot springs. Better not risk it, even though they, gosh, it would have been so nice last night under that full moon. But I feel like, I mean, just because I can't get in all the way doesn't mean I can't at least just put my feet in, you know? At least try out the waters with my toes because I've never met a bacteria or an amoeba that can enter through your toes. Oh yeah, this water feels great. Oh, and the bottom is very nice and silty, kind of sandy. Muddy. Mmm, look at that. 
perfect for an E. coli mud pack. Anyway, the sad story of Trago Hot Springs is kind of, I guess, emblematic of why we can't have nice things. I mean, here was this beautiful natural hot spring out in this beautiful desert. You could camp out here for weeks and soak in the hot spring and just have a fine time. But unfortunately, well, like I said earlier, people are just kind of gross, man. I mean, yeah, some of it is people not cleaning themselves properly, let's just say. But also part of it is, I think a lot of people just get lazy uh, when they have to poop in nature. I made a whole video about the right way to poop outdoors and it's pretty straightforward. You just dig a hole at least six inches deep and do it at least a hundred feet from any water source. But apparently there are some people who just can't be bothered with any of that and well i guess they end up pooping and peeing too close to the hot springs and i think that is how a lot of this e coli contamination <laughs> happens although that definitely doesn't explain the vegas pool party e coli i mean there's bathrooms at those pool parties it's very easy to just go to the bathroom when you need to but well you know how people are in vegas <laughs> they get drunk they don't want to get out of the pool like that's why I don't go to those Vegas pool parties. But unfortunately, there's a lot of gross idiots in this world. And consequently, I can't soak in this hot spring today. So I guess I actually understand why those rich, bougie hippies who own the Fly Geyser don't just let every random traveling Tom, Dick, and Harry, emphasis on the Harry and Dingleberry, soak in their hot springs. I mean, if they just let anybody go into those hot springs, well, they'd be littered with beer cans and shotgun shells in no time, and they'd probably quickly become cesspools of E. coli and cholera. So yeah, it was a bummer that I wasn't able to soak here in beautiful Trago hot springs or in the beautiful Fly Geyser hot springs, but well, I'm still glad I took that Fly Geyser tour and at least got to see it in person. And I guess I'm glad I came over here to poor, filthy, beleaguered little Trago hot spring. If only to make this public service announcement. People, clean your buttholes and don't poop within a hundred feet of the springs.